This is Father Owen Lee, someone who fell in love with Mozart's opera when he was very young and has since had many occasions to remark that Don Giovanni, more than any opera save perhaps only Tristan and Isolde, has caught the imagination of artists, composers, poets, philosophers, psychologists, men of letters, and music lovers. The opera itself is imperfect in conception, a miscarriage as drama, that the libretto is disjointed, marred by implausible incidents, peopled mainly with one-dimensional figures and confused in its moral position. The truth is we have never been able to form an adequate idea of what Don Giovanni is. It defies classification. The librettist, that witty rascal Lorenzo da Ponte, wanted it to be an out-and-out -out comedy, with the vis comica, the comic force of the old Roman clown Plautus. At least that's what he told his doctor years later, adding that it was Mozart who was set on making it serious. Da Ponte may for once have been telling the truth. We know that Mozart always took a hand in the shaping of his librettos, and that in the course of writing Don Giovanni, he also wrote the poignant string quintets in C minor and G minor, and had lost the father who had loved and bullied him all his life. Something of this seriousness is in Don Giovanni, which begins with the death of a father, in a scene with a special poignancy in the string writing. All the same, Mozart entered Don Giovanni in his personal catalogue as an opera buffa, the standard name for a hundred years for comic opera. So you be the judge. Do you think these opening measures in the key of D minor fit the puppet show, the opera buffa, the drama giocoso? Do you think, when you turn the page to this main section of the overture, you are listening to the titanic struggle of Satan against God, or of Oedipus against his father? Parts of Don Giovanni are opera seria, and other parts opera buffa. But, as you will hear in this performance under Carlo Maria Giulini, the work as a whole is something more than the sum of its parts. It is comedy vividly thrown into tragic relief. It is at least the partial embodiment of all the theories. Its ambiguities have been its glory. The action begins in the garden of a palace in a city that is probably 17th century Seville. It is night. A commoner paces up and down, wrapped in a cloak, complaining that he has to watch night and day while the master is busy with his pleasures. Why can't he be the gentleman for a change? Here is Giuseppe Tadei as that commoner, Leporello. Sagra dir, piova e vento sopportar, mangia il male e mal dormir. Notte giorno faticar, night and day I'm worked to death. Suddenly, while the servant makes unseemly comments, the master appears, a dashing figure, lavishly dressed, concealing his face, and not entirely able in his flight to escape the lady who is struggling with him and calling for help. Don Giovanni has ravished, or attempted to ravish, Donna Anna. In a moment her father, a royal commander of armies, the Commendatore, is there, with his sword drawn. And though the father is now advanced in years, the young Giovanni is compelled to fight him. Anna rushes off, and soon her father falls mortally wounded. Many writers have suggested that the death of his own father unleashed in Mozart some dark force, a kind of demonic clang in the music associated with the dying commendatore. 
who returns as a messenger from another world at the opera's end. Beethoven copied out the poignant passage where the father dies and remembered it when he wrote his Moonlight Sonata. The musical resemblance between the two moonlit passages is unmistakable, though Beethoven's is a romantic piano landscape and Mozart's a sinister trio for three dark male voices. In this case, Giuseppe Taddei, Gottlob Frick as the dying commendatore, and, as Don Giovanni himself, Eberhard Wächter. Then, abruptly, everything changes. The orchestra stops playing, a harpsichord strikes up, and Leporello and his master begin singing in recitative, Mozart's usual shorthand for quick passages of dramatic development. And with the change from orchestra to harpsichord, the tragic drama turns suddenly, if not comical, at least sardonically cynical, and wind swift. Leporello murmurs through the darkness, Who's dead, you or the old man? Giovanni whispers, Idiot, the old man, of course. Leporello exclaims, Bravo, two charming projects, rape the daughter and murder the father. Giovanni shouts, It's what he asked for. Leporello jokes, And Donna Anna, did she get what she asked for? Shut up, says the master, or you'll get something like it yourself. Oh, I've nothing to say, says the servant. Then the orchestra strikes up again, and we feel ourselves back on familiar operatic ground. This is tragic, surely, and we are meant to feel sorry for the bereaved Donna Anna and her chivalrous fiancé, Don Otavio. They enter with servants and torches, and piercing dissonances announce that they have discovered the body of the Commendatore. <laughs> Anna falls on her father's corpse and faints. Ottavio calls for help, has the body taken away, and tries to bring his fiancée to her senses, when, recovering, she momentarily mistakes him for the unknown man who has killed her father. He tells her tenderly she will now have both a father and a husband in him. But she, a true Spanish noblewoman, wants vengeance, and he joins her in swearing it. Here are Luigi Alva and Joan Sutherland.
as the dawn comes up, we are with Don Giovanni and Leporello fleeing down the street, the master bullying the servant into silence, boasting but intent on getting safely away to his nearby castle, till in front of an inn he senses the presence of a woman. Nostrils and imagination alone tell him she is beautiful. The two men hide to map out the territory, and the lady appears, Dona Elvira, in the person of Elizabeth Schwarzkopf. The music implies that, beautiful though Elvira is, there might be something slightly dotty about her. She is, in fact, a character midway between opera seria and opera buffa, what Mozart called mezzo carattere, by turns serious and comic, and sometimes both at once. Just now she's threatening to tear the heart out of the man who has loved and left her. But does the music ask us to take her seriously? says Giovanni. I'll have to console her. And then, too late, he finds she's a lady he has recently loved and left, back in Burgos. Elvira proclaims herself the instrument of a just and punishing heaven. Leporello says she talks like a book. Giovanni makes a quick escape and leaves Elvira to his servant. Leporello then gets his famous catalogue aria. He unrolls the list of his master's conquests, two thousand and sixty-five of them, in various parts of Europe and Asia. Spain, of all lands, is in the lead so far, with a thousand and three conquests. The list includes peasant girls and servant girls, countesses, baronesses, marchionesses, and princesses, blondes for their sweetness, brunettes for their constancy, plump ones in winter, slim ones in summer the majestic giantess and the mere slip of a girl, and older ones, too, for the pleasure of adding them to the list. Such cataloging is a comic device as old as Aristophanes, familiar from the Commedia dell'arte, done to a tee by Gilbert and Sullivan, but no one has ever done it better than Mozart and da Ponte here. The aria is happily heartless, with the librettist's censorable lines made completely acceptable, even in this feminist sage, by the elegance and wit of the music. Madamina, il catalogo è questo, delle belle che amò il padron mio, un catalogo è che ho fatto io, osservate, leggete con me, osservate, leggete con me. In Albania, two hundred thirty one. Cento in Francia, in Turchia, no bancura. In Spagna, in Spagna, so già mille tre, mille tre, mille tre. Don Giovanni has now fled the city and is making for his castle when, in the early morning, he espies a rustic party on their way to a wedding. Our maiden and youth here are Graziella Scuti and Piero Capuccilli. <laughs> Vi 
Pennetti leggeri di testa, leggeri di testa, non andate girando di là e qua e là e qua e là. Poco dura dei matti la festa, dei matti la festa, ma per me è cominciato, non ha cominciato, non ha. Che piacere, che piacere che sarà. He is Mazzetto, and she is the adorable Zerlina. She tells us she is going to marry Mazzetto, but will she? Don Giovanni shows an interest in the wedding party and invites them all up to his villa. Leporello will show them the master's gardens, rooms, and etchings. Giovanni himself will escort Zerlina. And Mazzetto need not worry. She will be with a cavalier. Mazzetto is suspicious, but there is nothing he, a lowly peasant, can do. Zerlina, alone with Giovanni, has suspicions, too. I know, she says, that you cavaliers are not often honest and sincere with women. That's just a lower-class rumor, says Giovanni, as he looks into her eyes. I want to marry you. And he breaks down all her defenses in the little love duet La Ci Darem La Mano. It is perhaps the most famous number in the score. Beethoven and Chopin wrote variations on it, and Liszt worked it prominently into his Don Juan fantasy. It is what Dorian Gray, in the film version, cannot miss hearing at the opera the night after his first seduction. And in James Joyce's Ulysses, it haunts that cuckolded Mazzetto Leopold Bloom, for his wife and her lover sing it and carry it to its physical conclusion. By this time we really should hate Giovanni, and yet no one seems to. So artlessly does Mozart combine the man's aristocratic bearing and the girl's pastoral shyness in this charming duettino. <laughs> But before Giovanni can get away with Zerlina, the overwrought Elvira is there to tell the peasant girl the truth about her supposedly chivalrous escort. That aria sounds like Handel at his most religious, appropriately enough for this lady seduced from a convent. There is something of the avenging angel about Elvira, though Giovanni says, as the angel hurries the peasant girl away, the devil is amusing himself today, he is interfering with my pleasures. Then suddenly Anna is there, with Ottavio. They do not at first think that Giovanni, a gentleman and a friend of Anna's noble family, could be the man they have been tracking. But they grow suspicious soon enough when Elvira reappears to accuse Giovanni of his many sins. The quartet that follows, cast in sonata form, traces the dawning of Anna's opera seria suspicions as Giovanni insists in opera buffa style that Elvira is quite mad. Oh, <laughs> 
Something in Giovanni's voice stirs a question, a memory in Anna, and when she is left alone with her Ottavio, she is sure. It was Don Giovanni who killed her father. Her aria, Or Sae Che L'Onore, shows that Anna in anger can hold her own with any of the goddesses and furies of the opere serie of the past. Ottavio is concerned at what this terrible desire for vengeance is doing to his Anna. Meanwhile, up in the castle, Leporello tells Giovanni that he's managed to start the rustics drinking, to calm Mazzetto down, and, yes, to get Serlina inside while contriving to lock Elvira out. Then Giovanni sings what the Germans have convinced us should be called the Champagne Aria. These few dizzying measures are important, however. They are as close to a portrait of our hero as Mozart ever allows us. Let all the dances be mixed up, Giovanni shouts to Leporello, and bring in all the girls you can find. I want to make love to them all behind the scenes. Tomorrow there'll be at least ten new names for the list. <laughs> In Giovanni's garden, where Leporello has enclosed the by now quite drunk country boys and girls, Serlina tries to make up with Mazzetto. She says that nothing has happened between her and Giovanni at all. But if it makes Mazzetto feel any better, he can beat her. By the end of her aria, Batti, Batti, Beat me, beat me, dear Mazzetto, her bridegroom-to-be is putty in her hands, and ornamental cellos are prancing bucolically around her song. <laughs> Then, after Giovanni has called all the peasants inside for what he hopes will be a very unorthodox celebration of Serlina's wedding, three uninvited guests appear in the garden below. They are clearly not peasants, but aristocrats, wearing Venetian-style masks, familiar in our day from their use in Amadeus, and great flowing cloaks that make it impossible to tell whether the wearers are men or women. Only their voices tell us that they are Anna and Ottavio, bent on revenge, and Elvira, who has led the way for them. From the window above, we hear the first strains of the famous Don Giovanni Minuet, and Leporello, who has been told to invite one and all to the party, looks down and bids the masked visitors come inside the castle, and they accept. Signore, 
Then, in a superb moment, the three Avengers pray to heaven to protect them, for the justice they must deal out terrifies them. At last we are inside Don Giovanni's castle. The word he uses, casino, can also mean brothel. The dancing is underway, and Giovanni has begun his conquest of Zerlina, when trumpets and drums announce the arrival of the three masked aristocrats. Everyone wonders who they are. Don Giovanni shouts, Viva la Libertà! And all the characters on stage repeat that phrase in a series of remarkable flourishes. <laughs> For Giovanni, liberty means, of course, license, his freedom to have his way with all his now-captive women. For Leporello, it means the freedom to cavort as freely as his master. For Zerlina, it means the freedom, if she dares, to give herself to a seigneur who might raise her to his station. For Mazzetto, it means the freedom to fight for what is rightly his. For Elvira, Anna, and Ottavio, it means the freedom their masks have given them to enter this den of iniquity and unmask the seducer and murderer. Viva la libertà! The battle lines are drawn. So, too, in a magical two minutes of music are the social lines. Don Giovanni had requested that all the dances be mixed up. Now they are. The minuet strikes up again, and while the three aristocrats dance, Giovanni and Leporello plot the seduction of Zerlina. Then, as the minuet continues, a second little orchestra on stage plays a contradance, and Don Giovanni uses it to lead Zerlina aside. Finally, after tuning up, a third little orchestra provides a clumsy Deutscher, or German dance, so Leporello can lead the befuddled Mazzetto off in the other direction. Eventually, all three dances in three different times 3-4, 2-4, and 3-8 play simultaneously. But let's start earlier in the proceedings with the minuet. Suddenly everyone hears from the next room Zerlina crying for help. Ottavio breaks down the door and reveals Don Giovanni, sword drawn, dragging Leporello, denouncing him as the would-be rapist. But no one is fooled. The maskers unmask, Ottavio protects the ladies with a pistol, they have caught Giovanni red-handed, 
and sing that heaven's thunder will strike him down that very day. Giovanni's words at this end of Act I are, Though the world should fall apart, nothing could make me fear. Act two of Don Giovanni seems at first to be a loose, episodic repetition of events from Act one, and de Ponte has come in for a fair amount of criticism for it. But when you read the sources, it is clear that the hard-pressed librettist has with considerable skill brought several diffuse strains together to make Act two a kind of recapitulation and resolution of Act one. We are back in the street before the inn where Elvira is staying. It is night. The same eventful day we've just been through is drawing to a close. Once again, Leporello is ready to leave his master's service. It's too dangerous. But he'll stay if the master will leave the women alone. Leave the women alone, Giovanni exclaims. Are you mad? They're more necessary to me than the bread I eat, the air I breathe. Asked whether he must betray them all, he says... To be faithful to one is to be cruel to the rest. I've been blessed with an overabundance of passion. I have to love them all. I can't help it if women can't think clearly and regard my natural feelings as betrayal. Accordingly, he proceeds to seduce Donna Elvira's maid. He and Leporello swap hats and cloaks. Elvira comes out on her balcony. Leporello mimes a serenade, while Giovanni, in the shadows, sings the words, and, like a puppet master, moves the servant's arms so that he gives the impression of being a gentleman. Elvira is fooled into thinking the servant is the master, mad with love for her. She descends, and Leporello lures her around the corner. For a while he will have the opportunity he wanted at the beginning of Act I, to play the gentleman. Then Giovanni, looking like Leporello, sings another serenade to the maid. Come to the window, please. If I don't get some relief, I'll die before your eyes. Vieni a consolare il canto mio Se neghi a me di dar qualche ristoro Davanti agli occhi But once again on this last day of his life, Giovanni is foiled. Mazzetto and a peasant posse suddenly appear to kill, if they can, the nobleman who invited them to his scandalous party and tried to rape the bride-to-be. They find him, too, but disguised. In the darkness they think he is Leporello. 
Giovanni, his life in danger, acts Leporello to the hilt and sends the posse off after the master. Then, when he has Mazzetto alone, he talks him out of his weapons, beats him up, leaves him in the street, and runs off laughing. Zerlina, perhaps knowing in advance that her bumptious bridegroom was going to get into trouble, appears with a lantern, checks out all the parts of Mazzetto that hurt, and, for medicinal purposes, lets him feel where her heart is beating. Then, around the corner, we are in a courtyard with three doors, part of Donna Anna's great house. It's time for an extended sextet. Leporello lures Elvira through one door, then tries to give her the slip through the second, just as, to torchlight and muted trumpets, Anna and Ottavio enter through it, on their way to the grave of her father. Leporello tries the third door, and is confronted there by Zerlina and Mazzetto. Everyone fastens on the man they think is Don Giovanni, and suddenly they are all astonished to find, in Giovanni's hat and cloak, only Leporello. Here we can mark the immense difference between the operas of Mozart and those of his predecessors. In the greatest of those, Handel, characters are defined by long solo arias and rarely, if ever, combine their voices. In Mozart, Solo arias also define the characters, but we learn at least as much about them in the ensembles, where each character is further defined in terms of the others. In this ensemble, as the six different voices weave their separate lines like six instruments in chamber music, the feeling is comic and serious in turns, and sometimes both at the same time, for each separate personage remains completely in character, coloring and colored by the others. <laughs> Leporello finally gets out through the third door in the courtyard. Anna leaves to mourn her father, and in his finest moment, Ottavio exhorts the others to comfort her. This is the courtly and demanding aria Il Mio Tesoro, a perennial test for the rare tenor who can sing long-breathed phrases and the rarer tenor who can find the manly strength that lies in the aristocratic delicacy of Mozart's musical line.
Mozart added two numbers at this point to provide his Vienna singers with additional opportunities, and one of them is so beautiful that virtually all productions today include it. Elvira, always something of a visionary, seems to see heaven crashing above and hell opening beneath the man she loves. Though he has betrayed her, she pities him and prays for him, and soon woodwind phrases, echoing her circular melody, suggest the halo around the head of some suffering medieval saint. We can't help but have noticed by now that while the other characters are given these large-scale, introspective, self-revealing pieces to sing, Don Giovanni himself gets only the slightest of arias. He is almost opaque, a hero defined not by himself, but by those he pursues and is pursued by. Nothing could be more different from the old concept of Handelian opera seria and that may be the single most innovative aspect of Mozart's opera. The hero is defined by the arias others sing. He does, however, define himself in the extroverted recitatives. As the harpsichord strikes up for more quick dialogue, we pass beyond the wall of Anna's courtyard. Giovanni nimbly leaps it. What a night, he exclaims, just made for chasing girls. He hears Leporello grumbling outside the wall and invites him in through a portal, bragging how easy it is to make love to women when they think he's a commoner. He claims he's just taken advantage of a woman who thought he was Leporello. Hey, what if that was my wife? the servant asks. Even better, laughs Giovanni, and his cruel laughter summons up a mysterious sound, a bass voice from nowhere singing, By dawn you'll have laughed for the last time. Who's there? Giovanni calls. The voice seems to be issuing from a great Baroque statue of the Commendatore. This is his house, and it is now clear we are standing in his courtyard at his grave. Leporello gets a little nervous, especially when his master makes him read the inscription at the base of the statue, and it says, Here I await vengeance on the blasphemer who sent me to my death. Giovanni laughs still more. And, as the orchestra starts up again, he forces Leporello at sword point to invite the statue to dinner. The statue nods assent. The scene is a locus classicus for the blending of opera buffa at its most buffoonish and opera seria at its most frighteningly serious. Here is the end of the scene, another trio for three deep male voices, beginning at the point where Giovanni himself invites the statue to dinner. Per 
marciamo via di qua, marciamo via di qua, di qua. There is one last scene before we leave the environs of Donna Anna's house, and that is her great accompanied recitative, Crudele, and aria Non Mi Dear. Anna tells Ottavio he ought not to think her cruel if she does not respond to his affections. She does love him, and heaven will soon come to help her, but we sense in the truly beautiful music that neither he nor she can understand what is really in her heart. Can Anna really love Ottavio after she has been attacked and her father murdered by Giovanni? Twice she has mistaken Ottavio for him, the man who haunts her imagination and memory. Perhaps now is the time to venture a thought on why Mozart's opera exerts such a disconcerting power. Its hero, whom we are never allowed really to know, seems to know us or at least he knows something vulnerable about all the characters that confront him. He senses that vulnerability and exploits it in the men as well as the women. They are all reduced to fixed attitudes and wonder about what he makes them feel. In this he is a real seducer. He makes the other characters see themselves in their weaknesses. They call one another cruel, but he is the cruel one. He seems to see unflinchingly into their souls. No wonder they want revenge. And yet there is something profoundly liberating about discovering oneself. At the climax of Act I, the characters wear masks, and the man they are advancing against prompts them to sing Viva la Libertà. He is the only one in their world who can give them a proper sense of their own individualities. No wonder they pursue him. In the final scene, a scene to parallel the one with the masks at the end of Act I, we are back in Giovanni's castle. He is already dining, and Leporello is serving him, and his private orchestra, which had played three tunes simultaneously before, plays three tunes successively now. Three tunes familiar from operas of Mozart's day, all of which Leporello, apparently an opera fan, knows very well. Suddenly Elvira appears in what proves to be a last-minute attempt to persuade Giovanni to change his life. She is the first, and then it is Leporello's turn, to see the statue inexorably approaching. Boldly Giovanni faces his fate as Elvira flees and Leporello cowers under the table. The music returns to the sinister D minor passage in the overture, yet Mozart daringly keeps the comic element interacting with the serious, as another trio for three dark male voices begins. The statue bursts open the doors, singing 
Don Giovanni, you invited me to dinner, and I have come. Now that the statue has accepted Don Giovanni's invitation, will he accept the statue's invitation to dine with him in the hereafter? He will, but he will not repent of his dissolute life, even when the threatening statue grips his hand. It is a moment of splendid bravado, and the music, even to ears that have heard Wagner and Strauss and Schoenberg, is genuinely frightening. Life returns to normal for our characters. Anna and Ottavio will marry after a year's period of mourning. Elvira will return to her convent. Serlina and Mazzetto will settle down merrily. And Leporello, back where he started, will look for a new master. Finally, to a rapid quasi-religious double fugue, the six characters point the moral for us, though, of course, we need take it no more seriously than would any Don Juan audience through the centuries watching a morality play at a carnival. This is the way evildoers end. The death of sinners always suits the life they lead. Mozart's final touch is what critic Alan Rich called that last little trail of stardust that the orchestra showers over the stage as the singers round off their adventure. It seems to me to say, you make of all this what you will.
Clearly, this mercurial drama with its vivid yet elusive characters is something more than its creators, its performers, its admirers, and its few detractors have been able to say.